Hello, everybody. I'm Chris Caligari, the organizer for Kubert. And this is our weekly meeting where we all gather and uh, talk about Kubert. Okay. Um, I'm going to post our meeting notes to the chat. Feel free to uh, follow along or uh, just follow along with screen share. Okay, here we are. Um, I'll give you guys a minute or two to uh, fill in any agenda or open floor items that uh, you may want to put in there. Uh, while we're waiting for folks to fill in uh, agenda items, um, is there anybody new with us that would uh, like to say hello? Let's look at our list. Looks like uh, just familiar faces. We do have a telephone call person. Yeah, this is Marcus Sorensen. Um, I'm away from my office, so I just dialed in via phone. Uh, well, still glad you can make it. You sound good, too. So. OK. Uh, well, let's begin. Um, Daniel Heller has the first item. So how about you start, Daniel? Yeah, hi, everyone. I was just wondering, um, in, uh, while I was looking at the uh, ETE lanes that we have in Cupert, um, there are a couple of old 1.70 lanes. And one of these is a storage lane, uh, which uh, tests Rookset. And I was uh, asking Roma more about that, and uh, he suggested that we might just streamline the six storage lanes and the Rooksef lanes. And I was wondering whether anyone uh, from the storage team, for example, or uh, regarding storage has some ideas whether that is a good idea or rather not. Um, and yeah, I, I just wanted to get some input. What do you mean by streamlining? I was thinking about just um, um, adding or enabling the Rook staff, uh within the Zig storage lane and, and testing both together. Or uh, that at least was, was, uh, was what Roman was suggesting that we should do probably for all lanes that we have, like uh, for uh, 119, 120, and 121, just enable the Rook staff testing also within the Zig storage lane and uh, have everything together. Yeah, that sounds good to me. Okay. Oh, that's that was easy. Thanks. So I I'd like to add on to uh to the SIG um, conversation. Um, Ryan Hallisey's been running the performance and metrics SIG, and uh, he conducts a a meeting on Thursday. Is there any interest in uh, doing something similar for storage and network. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I guess I'll speak for we we would uh, I, if there is demand for it, uh, storage people will be there to listen and <laughs> contribute. Uh, so um, 
Yeah, I mean, I think that we have been getting um, some more contributions from community, so it may make sense. Um, I'm just, you know, I think at least when I'm speaking for storage, we're definitely not at the level of Qbert, but yeah, I mean, it, it may be monthly or something. Yeah, Michael, just uh, feel free to reach out and uh, I'll get you set up if, uh, if you want to do a, a monthly meeting specifically for storage. Uh, I got Ryan set up and he's been running with it and uh, we see his meeting notes being posted out to uh, out to the mailing list. So uh, they're moving on nicely. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, and Ashley has the next topic regarding alert levels. Hey, yeah, so Shirley had reached out to me and was asking about um, the proper alert levels for our different Prometheus alerts and specifically tagged me in one asking if it was, should be critical versus warning. I was just wondering if we have any documentation about what level things should be or how we decide on that. David, do you have anything? Or... Yeah, I don't think we have any documentation. I was, I was waiting for, I was hoping somebody else would <laughs> speak up because I don't have a great uh, understanding of this. So there's some background noise. Um, I th think that's something we need to shore up. So we probably need to have a better understanding of how this is used in practice. So what warning means to an operator versus critical and, and things like that. Um, it's, is that what this, so this PR that you just created, is that creating different? Let me look at it. Uh, the one link Shirley had created, um, and she was asking me specifically about an alert of if a, the vert handler daemon set doesn't roll out, does that count as critical? And part of me was like, well, it's critical for Qbert infrastructure, but their VM workloads could still be working. So is it actually critical? And how do we want to define this? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, my suggestion is to run with that and uh, maybe create a PR for our monitoring uh, or our metrics um, markdown in the docs directory um, with what you think the recommendation should be. And we'll just kind of start the discussion from there. Because I don't think okay. uh, nobody spoke up, so I don't think we have a good handle on it. All right, yeah, that sounds good. Makes sense to me. All righty. Hey. Um. Nothing else. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and talk about an event that's coming up here on Tuesday. Um, Tuesday um, is early in the morning. I hit every number except the right number. Uh, June 15th, uh, 1500 UTC. Uh, David Vossel is going to do a, a live stream with, uh, with Siam, who is a CNCF partner. He runs a uh, a monthly live stream talking about various Kubernetes topics. And uh, this month is going to be Kubert. So this has uh, been quite some time in the, in the making. Um, and uh, we're finally going to go forward with it. Hey, David, do you have a quick link to his YouTube stream? Yeah, let me, I think I do. Let me find that real quick. I could hunt it, hunt it down, but it would take me some time and I want to advertise it while everybody's let me here. Double check that it works before I okay. post it. Yeah, this looks right. Uh, let me find the meeting now. Okay. So did I just post something? Or? Oh, 
oh, I'm on the wrong Google account, so I can't actually type into this document. <laughs> There we go. Okay. So that should be his YouTube channel. Yeah, I have no idea what to expect from this. It's going to be interesting. Maybe, uh, maybe it'll be good. Um, I hope it's good. Yeah, this was the, uh, this event was arranged through Red Hat Ospo and Josh Berkus. So it's he's not just a, a random person that just popped up and. Uh, said, hey guys, how about doing a live stream? Um, so they they approached us through CNCF channels and then through Red Hat. Um, we have had some some scams that have approached us. So this is not a scam. He, he expects about 3,000 viewers worldwide. So no pressure, David. <laughs> yeah, hopefully I don't forget how to how to talk or something. That would be embarrassing. <laughs> All right. Um, so we also have a KVM forum and um, KubeCon and, and A. And all things open. Uh, KVM forum and KubeCon NA, our papers have been submitted. Um, we're in a holding pattern uh, waiting on uh, the council's decision. Um, same with all things open. Uh, all things open, uh, we are developing the demo. Um, currently. So if you have a Raspberry Pi and uh, some good internet bandwidth and you want to participate in this demo, please let me know. Um, we're all, the, the content for this demo is also going to be built into a blog post. So um, even if we don't get accepted into the, into the, uh, the conference, um, we're still going to produce some content to be published. So volunteers are always needed. And we'll be doing some Bitcoin mining. So there's a money making opportunity. Dang, still no volunteers. All right. Um, open floor is empty. Does anybody else have uh, anything you want to talk about? I had an idea that maybe we should um, go through the some threads on the mailing list. What do you guys think about adding uh, a section for that? Yeah, sure. Any open discussions that are on the mailing list seems pertinent here. Okay. Just do a quick. The next topic from Itamar is also interesting. What, what was that? You should maybe go to groups.google.com instead. Yeah, right. <laughs> I was just thinking, like, uh, <laughs> I was just saying that uh, ah. Itamar listed the PR to discuss, but uh, I mean, th this topic is uh, pretty general. Maybe we can um, talk about this first. Okay. Uh, okay, yeah, let's do that. Uh, Itamar, go ahead with your pull request. Hi, everyone. Whoa, 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 whoa. Your, your microphone is going wild. Oh, just a second. Is it okay now? Uh, slightly better. I know. <laughs> and much better. Thank you. Sorry for that. Might want um, to go up. Might want to go up one more notch. Uh, okay. 
Okay, I hope, I hope it's good now. Um, You've got a happy medium. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I was speaking about this PR in the last community meeting. Um, so basically what it does is it shows that PMIs with post model CPU are being uh, migrated only to nodes that support this CPU model. And we thought about how we can test this. Um, and then me and Vladik uh, thought that maybe um, we can make a high performance lane uh, for like uh, high performance features that need very heterogeneous uh, a cluster with a lot of different nodes with different hardware and stuff like that for specific uh, features. Um, and I thought to, to ask you if you find this uh, valuable. Yeah, um, we have some features definitely which would justify such a lane, which we kind of under test right now because all nodes are homogeneous. From my perspective, it would probably make sense. Did you think about what you would use for that or how you would do it? Um, I didn't think about the specific or implementations yet, but I did think about that we will be free to add new nodes uh, from uh, new hardware or, or stuff like that and make a very messy uh, uh, cluster for, for certain features. Yeah, I would. I would definitely have for the T, uh, TSC uh, CPU flag also a case where it would be interesting to simulate different nodes, with different timers. Yep, yeah. no man, different topology layout. Yeah, yeah. Right now we have this minimum difference, like the first node has no CPU manager and the second node has CPU manager, but that's the whole difference which we have right now. I guess we could do that in Kubernetes CI even for most things. Okay, yeah. great. If it's valuable, then I'll look into it. Mm, yeah. Okay, so well, thank for some time in Kubernetes CI, if we could come up with an approach where you define maybe in a YAML file the cluster you want to have with different features instead of excessive command line passing and I guess your the, what what you need there may might be a good start for that. Okay, sure. Okay, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Irmar. And uh, one other thing, Chris, I'm sorry, I forgot while you mentioned the uh, mailing list, um I forgot to bring up and to, to ask her. There was one ask uh, from the mailing list uh, about uh, someone having problems with Python clients. And to be honest, I don't know who is today maintaining this today. I, uh, does anyone else know? The Python client for Cooper, do it? Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't think that any, we had months ago already some users which were using it for Ansible or so I think but since then I'm not sure at least no one from us maintainers has is having a look into it so okay. they just get for as long as the the tool which generates it compiles I think it's it's published but no one is maintaining it at the moment my Python uh, is uh, far from uh, being good enough to help him. So if anyone is better in Python, maybe someone can come up with an answer for, for the uh, email. At least. Hey, might it be worthwhile to create a GitHub issue on this? 
think so, yeah. myself on that. Okay, let's, let's see if I can get to this without exposing all my personal email. I sent a link in the chat. Oh, thanks. <laughs> We should just go through here and kind of do it like we did with uh, the we do with bugs. So if there's any email here that hasn't been answered, we can take a look at it. Oh yeah, sorry everybody for that meeting invite I sent out yesterday. For some reason, Fabian wanted me to do that. Uh, he wanted me to add the Google account to the weekly meetings. And for some reason, this one got sent out. I know I sent, I hit the do not send invite button, but it did anyways. <coughs> so the, the Google Groups account got about 50 uh, declined messages from, uh, from everyone. So thanks for that. <laughs> uh, we talked about Daniel Hiller's um e to e lanes oh here's a good one um if uh if anyone knows of any uh new uh major users um of kubert let's get our user list updated um this will uh, apply to, yeah, the users list is in the adopters file. And uh, we'll be using that for the petition to uh, uh, graduate into incubating status. That's pretty important. I should have brought that up in the, in the general agenda. Using Kubert client on Kube Math Pool. And he posted it out to Slack, and nobody was there to take up the topic. Does anybody know anything about this? I have no clue when they're looking at this. Maybe it's an issue with the new uh, Kubernetes client go version. I don't know. Kedis networking plumbing. What is this repo? Do we have anybody from networking on the meeting today? Yeah, but well, uh, I... the person that asked it is, is also from the network team. Hmm. Oh. 
Ramazan and network team? Yeah, I think he didn't. I don't think he asked something about networking. It's, he got into a corner. I don't know. Had the problem with, uh, with this. This kind of sounds a bit like messed up code generation. Like, I don't know how, how this, the rape replays build up they're working with, but I've seen similar errors when uh, rebasing my Kubernetes master and, and not running make clean before running make build or something. So my suspicion would also be that it's probably mixed with a client with a library from Kubernetes in a different version and there is an yeah. issue. It's like yeah. I've, I, so one thing that I just want to throw out there, I've seen other um, community people um, talk about difficulties uh, importing the kubevert client go. And uh, a lot of the times they just want to like, they just want the API definitions and none of the really clients. So I wonder if it would make sense to do like Kubernetes where we have a kubevert API and a kubevert client go. So if you just want the API so you can use, um, you know, the controller runtime client easily, uh, it won't bring in a bunch of stuff that you don't care about. Yeah, yeah, that definitely makes sense. Which reminds me that I have a PR somewhere in my Git history where I tried to make our code ready for the code generators like you did for, for CDI. Yeah. And that would probably solve it. Would you guys? Yeah, I think that would be a great idea. That's something we've we've run into recently as well. And um, you you can you can import just the API, but it also has most of the pain as far as the modules. You know, figuring out all the compatible yeah. modules. Um, there's a there was an environment variable added that lets you pick like whether you want to use v1 or v1 alpha three. Um, but some of the some of my team members uh, use that, and they just kind of found it a bit cumbersome, I guess. So yeah. this would be really welcome. Yeah, and and yeah, David added this workaround with the environment variable until we 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 restructure our code to be ready for the code generators. Uh, yeah, I I have to go back to that task. I'll try to make some progress there. Would you all remind mind replying to him? Yeah, I mean, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I, I can. Hi, right, yeah. Thank you. Great. Um, as, as Slack was mentioned there, I I have a question that I, I, I wanted to ask a few times. Like, how do we see the Slack channel as a responsibility for support? Because I think I also ask questions. Sometimes you get a response. I see a lot of messages, people posting PRs there, but I'm never sure if everybody feels responsible being on the channel and actively responding to it. Like I, I, I know I don't, and I should be on there more and I, I'll try that, but. That's a really good question. Um, and I don't have an answer. Um, I'm happy to, uh, to take that up to with, uh, with Josh Burkus and uh, get some definition on what's expected out of Slack. I, I, right now, if I have a problem, I know the right people to ask, or I, at least know people I, I can bother and, they, and they, if they don't know, they, they'll tell me. Mm -hmm. um, and that's my shortcut. And I, I suppose more people have that, but it's not ideal for new people, maybe. I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so I think some people are trying to answer most of the questions on Slack, but yeah, we don't have any official. Mm -hmm decisions on how to handle it, yeah. Let's see here, I'll just stick that into the open floor. Yeah, right now, if it's an important problem, I would probably tell people ask on the mailing list because people get that more actively. It's more pushy, but. Mm -hmm.
It's nothing that hard to do. Wise. I have a small question. Can I ask it? Oh, yes, go ahead. Um, I think we upgraded the Google to, to use Go 116, right? Yes. Uh, so my ID started to do crazy stuff. Uh, it, it got uh, he didn't, he didn't understand this somehow. So I checked the, the, the Go mode file. Still has the 113 in the tag. Does it, does it have any effect? Do you know? Oh, yeah. It, it could have a, an effect on some tools and on some development EDAs, I guess. Yeah, so it should be updated. Okay, thanks. Did I get that note correct? Roman. Yeah, 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 yeah. Some tools, yeah. Uh, so what basically can happen is that uh, like tools use it to detect the minimum version and they compare it with their version, what they have, and then they think oh, everything is fine, but then it doesn't compile and may not even even understand the go mod file then properly and stuff like this so it can be very confusing like pretty much like edward described <laughs> okay great okay we're at 736 i think we did a a good a good shot at checking uh the mailing list to make sure things have been addressed. Um, how about we uh, move on to, and do a bug scrub? So I don't think we did a bug scrub last week. We did not. So we should do one this week. Who would like to drive that? Roman, David. Do you want one of us to share a screen for doing yes. this? Yes, yeah, yeah, I can share this. I, yeah, I wasn't prepared for that. I hope that my desktop settings okay. can share a screen. Let me see. <laughs> yeah, that's always that's always the problem for me. Yeah, let me see. Desktop. So, can you see something? Yep, looks great. Okay, great. So, issues. Um, let's see. Did we always start from the newest to the oldest one, or? Yeah, I think that's the way it works. Okay, okay. okay. So we have a new one. Why not do word CTL? We start test them. The pod will be deleted and then we created by virt controller and virt launcher pod name change to it. Virt launcher test from something else. So I think that the answer here would be that we need the random name because we don't know if the pod name is already taken by another instance. So if two pods so if someone creates a pod named test and then someone creates a VM named test, then we would have a naming conflict. Uh, it's for, it's, I think it can even be simpler uh, than that. It's for live migration, for example. There's times yeah. we have to have two pods at the same yeah. time. Uh, right. So we have to use a generated name. Yeah, right. Kind of sounds like 
the person is expecting that the pod never gets killed in the first place and it, the VM restarts inside the pod. Hmm, can also be. Oh, I see. There's a difference between restart and reboot uh, that we need to be clear about. To be honest, yeah, I'm also practice. surprised that a restart would, would reschedule the whole VM instead of just restarting it. Yeah, in place restart is, yeah, the dynamic may be a little bit. Yeah, so that's like an external restart. We're using the cluster resources or coordination to, to, to restart. If somebody, for example, does a reboot inside their uh, Linux guest, if it's a Linux virtual machine, then I don't think that a new pod gets created. I think it's all self-contained. Yeah, yeah, if you reboot the VM, then it's contained still from inside the guest, but still there would be the option to do an in-place re reboot from, from the QEMU level, like resetting the machine. But I think we have some work there to do the reset and so on. Okay. We'd have to really think about that. that that's actually pretty invasive. That's interesting. Hmm. Could also some be something the admin wants to say, like I want when somebody restarts, I want it to reschedule to balance my cluster more instead of because it's a good opportunity to rebalance the VM. So makes sense, yeah. but I could understand people not wanting that because it's faster, I guess. Yeah. You're guaranteed that you've already allocated. Well, here's the thing. If we keep the same pod, we're guaranteed that the resources are already allocated and we're not going to lose those resources uh, during a restart for some reason. So I can see that being valuable. Um, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that's something, that's something. Yeah. yeah, information so, on why the reporter cares is what I'm most. Uh, yeah, and uh, that's what I asked for what's exactly what what he's exactly wondering about and um let's see but what also why like yeah. why why is this a problem for them <laughs> yeah um, actually, I, I think this is actually a very good point that is why we want to have a different path like for example in my use case right if you use pad ip then if you do a reboot the ip won't get changed right but if you do a restart it's going to move to a different path in ip change i mean in the case of using hard ip so actually i think this i personally think there would be a nice idea if we could restart within the same path but um have a different setting though um which i don't know if it's possible maybe that possible for example, when I use restart, right, what I do is, for example, I need to update the CPU or the memory. And then to make that to be take effect, I need to restart. In that case, is it even possible to do a within, like, keep it within the same path? Um, I think right now it's not possible from the community's perspective to extend uh, the resources during the runtime for a pod. But uh, there is the cap accepted for a pretty long time. I think uh, some people from IBM provided the cap, which allows changing the re changing request and limit level during the runtime of a pod. Sadly, it only got to the level of being accepted and the actual work on it did not start as far as I know. And it stuck for some time. But once that would be there, it would be possible. Sorry, I have to close my door. Okay, thank, thank you for that answer. Because I was also thinking this, um, but I, I see that if I change the resources, it looks like I have to use a different path. And then I have to use restart to, to get that applied, that change applied. Okay. Are you, um, so you mentioned the pod IP changing. Uh, this is one path um, okay. that we could, you know, reboot within the same pod to keep the IP for a little bit longer. Uh, right. Are you still impacted? I mean, of course, if like a node failure happened or the pod just or the guest crashed or something like that, you would get a new IP. 
so um, are you concerned about still needing to handle that scenario or um, is it okay I, in some situations? I was just thinking that if in general, right, if from our own user experience, like in a general VM, right, when you restart it, you expect the things keep the same, IP and things like that. Yeah. Right, but uh, the thing is, this, that's something like this this guy, right, who filed this request. For, oh, surprising that I restarted uh, something changed. I have to use different IP to access it. Right, so I think he made some sense. He, he, his comment makes sense if you think about that behavior. So it would be nice if we, really, we can really keep everything to be look the same to him um, after we restart. But on the other hand, I can see that if we allow you modify resources and restart to to apply this new configuration then maybe that make it impossible to to get the same part that's just my comments here yeah. Yeah, i think keeping the product is a good example um uh, we have there should definitely come at some point uh root ctl something like root ctl restart and root ctl uh with, with uh uh, uh, QEMU level reset and restart with the uh, ACPI reboot from outside. And there the QEMU process would still be alive the whole time. Just the VM inside would be restarted or rebooted from outside with more or less force. And this def makes definitely sense to have. Yeah. Right. Cool. Right. Then the next one. Lauren is is fails. I think that we are covered. Uh, Marcus, I think you have, if you're still on the call, I think we have all the details there on this one. I don't think we have to discuss it here. Yeah, great. I'm good. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, um, that one's for me. Yeah. Just for uh, for, for CI you. stuff. That's an interesting one. And Kubert VMI CPU course metric. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I guess it makes sense to ask for a few use cases. I could think of some, but it would be interesting to see that what we already have from the from the pod level and from the actual consumption level. Um, I, I, I could think about exposing this metric for getting a, an idea on how much is used in the system, but I have the suspicion that maybe there is already enough provided through Kubernetes metrics, you know, through Kubernetes metrics. I'll ask for more details. Does that sound fine? Yeah, the way I read this, um, it sounds like it should, the, the metric should be per VM and that could result in a huge load on the respective Prometheus instances if everybody scrapes it, depending on the amount of VMs. So it might, I don't know. Yeah. How is the node or, or node exporter? So does the sun this answer sound right? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Next one. Keep Mac pool Mac controller manager going in to crash of backup when creating a new HCO deployment. Okay, this, I'm not sure if this is even related to Qbert. Okay, let me just ask here. If is this more 
and if zero issue or Kubernetes uh, uh, pool issue or a keyboard issue. It sounds a little like it's not related to keyboard. Great. Any more comments on that one? Yeah, it really looks more like it's something for HCO and not for keyboard. Let's see if we can move it there. Windows VM can be launched on v 37 but not be launched on newer versions. That's an interesting one, which did it already get some attention? Okay, let's start from the beginning. No attention yet. Policy, blah, blah, blah. So this YAML seems to have worked on Cirrus 37. Ah. Uh oh. Machine type. Yeah, well, that should still be Q35. PC dash Q35. Also, uh, I mean, it looks like a good Windows 7 example. Mm -hmm. See the diff here. Uh, I guess it would make sense in addition. Ah, ah yeah. Um, this is probably an issue with going from 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 the uh, non-transitional. Uh, from the going from the transitional to the non-transitional virt IO driver. Um, this means that at some point, Libre changed its default, and we have to now explicitly choose, and we new, choose the newer one, and people have to extra request the older version for Virt.io. Let me just uh, sit in the... Uh, Go. That answer sound good for people? Yep. Great. I guess there is the communication communication flow is nice. So when I'm not also giving the answers immediately myself, but on the ticket. So next one, support admin configured custom random class name and virtual and virtual launcher pods. Oh, uh, Marcus, I think that was also discussed on the mailing list, right? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I comment on this um, on the per user issue. Uh, okay, so this is is this not for the uh, this is is this for the uh, for 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 the launcher pod, not for the the run, uh, not for the control plane. Okay. What what do you? Oh, I, I sorry, I just uh, misread the ticket for a moment and thought that this is about setting it on the control plane, but it's no, no, on no. the launcher. It's on the Correct. Yeah. yeah, there was some confusion in the in the discussion about that as well. So I think it <laughs> makes total sense to have a global default because if people have multiple runtimes, then uh, at least one of them would certainly make sense for Kubeverb. Maybe not all of them. Uh, yeah, so that makes so, sense. The per user one. Uh, Maybe if somebody finds that useful. The thing is, during that discussion, yeah, that discussion, yeah. I think, um, it started being apparent that the per user run class, or whatever it's called, possibly was being uh, desirable because of a side effect uh, with the run class, or whatever it's called, runtime class. You can set scheduling uh, information on it. So if a pod has the runtime class name set, then it will inherit the uh, runtime classes uh, scheduling affinity and node um, mm -hmm. selectors and everything. So that was being used to kind of do some odd stuff uh, here, which I don't know if it's desirable or not. I think that it could possibly make sense to expose runtime class name on each VMI, the use case in this uh, issue uh, did not convince me that they were using it properly, though. Okay, okay, yeah. Yeah, I was a little confused by that as well. Um, it sounded like it was to be used as kind of a shortcut, uh, so to speak, so that you didn't have to put, um, you know, your node affinity on your on your VMI itself or. Um, and there, then there was the whole thing about device plugins and well, is it going to pick the right? Because they they wanted to use runtime class to pick the hardware, I guess. Um, I think so. For for the use case I had in mind, and I think it was mentioned on the mailing list, was you know I think the big one that people are going to have is they may be running Kata in their clusters, and they don't want to run Kubert on Kata. So um, you know having that. Um, kind of a global, this is what Kubert uses for the vert launcher pod. Um, seems like it would cover that case. That sounds that great. Still yeah. Sounds, yeah. yeah. I think maybe, we would accept that right away. Maybe, maybe, maybe yeah, making it a list when you can configure it so that you can have, or, or an exclusion list or something, maybe both. But I, I could also, I mean, I don't know how realistic it is, but in theory, we could have cryo on a part of, on part of the nodes and stock on another part. And it would work for both. I don't uh, know if this is really relevant. You have to pick one on, I think you can only pick one on the pod. So an exclusion list or allow deny list would only work. Yeah, if we, I mean, you can just not set it, right? And it would just go to any one of the nodes. Or is it wrong? The, the way it works is that you set the runtime class on the pod. So it's an opt in to what you want. There's no way. I, I'm not aware of a way to exclude it other than okay, okay. Yeah. you would have to do some other magic with okay, the, yeah. the node selector. Then we would not set it by default, but people can configure it globally and then it would go to a specific one. I would start with that. And then if we have a nice. use case that really sounds good for why we would need a per VMI uh, run class, runtime class name, then we can consider it uh, that is like an iteration on the global yeah. default. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. And it's covered in the anyway. The discussion is already in full progress on the issues. Then we have a flaky heartbeat unit test. Um, yeah, the test has an issue sometimes and needs to be fixed. And this is just a, a reminder that it needs to be done. We had this ticket here too. Uh, panic. Error relieved in required files. Oh. Oh, 
we live in bar files Okay, it looks like SE Linux would be permissive, so we may not even have to relabel here. And we should just maybe just maybe just have another case where we have to skip this step. Um, yeah, let me. Oh, I forgot to do it on the other ones, but we have to we have this trash accepted label thing even. I see that C Linux is disabled or is in permissive mode. Yeah, uh, Roman, from the, uh, the little I'm seeing in the code, we treat like yeah. permissive and we tr treat disabled as don't do anything and everything else as, uh, yeah, let's retag. Okay, yeah. I mean, yeah, uh, I guess it makes sense, right? We don't want to, I mean, for audit and so on, it's useful. I just wonder why we don't have access for, to change this. We are fully root. This is more actually yeah, more interesting question. Something else uh, is a miss. Yes, I agree. Uh, it's too much. There was something about read only also in the logs above, right? Libis image create store could not access model store at Vazil or, or it is not a directory. Read only file system. Could not collect policy handler. Uh, stack it SKE. This line indicates that this Linux may be set up in a non standard way. Can you implement it somehow? On, on how is it called? Stack it or stack it? Let's see what he comes back with. Okay, I think we are out of time. Um, yes, indeed we are. Okay, thank you for going through the issues with me. I'll stop sharing now. Yeah, thank you, Roman, for handling that. Um, it's always good to have an expert drive the, the bug scrub. Um, so um, that concludes our, our meeting for the week. And uh, I'll let you guys go. And uh, I will take two minutes from you this time instead of giving you 30. Um, well, we'll finish up here and uh, enjoy your week. See you next time. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.